When they received this picture, scientists were confused. What is here? 75 years ago, it was made by a rocket that was previously used to bomb cities. At an altitude of 105 meters, it took a few shots and shattered to pieces. But the film survived, and it provoked many questions, the answers to which are increasing every year. In this video, you'll find out which planet resembles the paintings of Van Gogh, where did the Arab probe go first, and where did astronomers see a horse's head? The Hubble Telescope Even those who aren't interested in space have heard about this space telescope. It has transmitted countless photographs of planets, star clusters, and space debris back to us here on Earth. It allowed us to discover the age of the universe, proved the existence of supermassive black holes and exoplanets, and revealed numerous other amazing finds in our cosmos. Just look at these photos, but be careful, they can really blow your mind. This image is considered to be one of the most famous photographs ever taken by the Hubble telescope. It's called the Pillars of Creation, and that's no coincidence, as it captures an active star-forming region in the Eagle Nebula. The pillars in the center of the photo are the result of the movement of charged particles and the cosmic wind. Outgoing streams of ionized gas are visible along the edges of the mountain ridge. What do you think is the secret of its shades of color? Each of them demonstrates different chemical elements. The blue zones are characterized by a high content of oxygen, green, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and red, sulfur. How do you like this nebula? The astronomers who first discovered it decided that it looks like a horse's head. Although officially it's called Barnard 33, this nebula is also known as the Horsehead Nebula. Here it seems as if storm clouds swooped down and covered the entire sky. In fact, in front of you, there are many young blue star clusters, giant glowing gas clouds, and dark dust lanes that cross Centaurus A. Is there life on Saturn? It was a mystery for decades until the Cassini probe set off for the nooks and crannies of this planet. Then it became clear that the galaxy around us is truly huge. It has an almost unfair number of planets, is there really no life there? Cassini didn't find an answer to this question, but it managed to become the first artificial satellite of Saturn and pass between its rings. It told us a lot about the Saturnian system, and in addition, it took a lot of beautiful photos, 323 to be exact, which was considered a record for quite a long time. For example, here you can see the rings of Saturn, which are illuminated by the Sun. Next to them, you can see a small dot. It is our Earth. Or here's another photograph compiled from 140 images in which the Earth peeks out from behind the rings of a giant planet. Now you realize just how tiny we are in the universe. In this photo was taken in 2013 and looks like an illustration for a science fiction movie. What do you think it is? It's just a North Pole storm over Saturn. Perhaps Cassini could have pleased us with other pictures, but its 20-year mission came to an end. The device entered the dense layers of Saturn's atmosphere and burned up. Astrophysicists sent it to certain death after it ran out of fuel. After the death of the probe, Cassini's last photographs came to Earth. They depict the night side of Saturn. The panorama is illuminated by sunlight reflecting off the rings of the gas giant. The pictures were black and white, but NASA added color, and now you can meditate on them.
we've received the strangest image of a satellite of Jupiter, which stirred NASA up in earnest and became one of the main discoveries of the entire Voyager mission. It turned out to be a volcanic eruption on Io, which made scientists understand that there are active volcanoes outside of the Earth. In general, the journey of the Voyagers has been going on for more than 40 years, and during this time, they managed to amaze us with many other images. Ready for the Parker Solar Probe NASA shots? Compared to the Voyagers, it's a very young traveler and journeyed into space just in the summer of 2018. Its main mission is to study the outer corona of the Sun. However, on its way to the Sun, the Parker probe has already taken a photo of the night side of Venus. The right side of the photo is filled with stars, while the left side is occupied by Venus. The dark spot in the center of the image is Aphrodite Terra, the largest mountainous region on the surface of Venus. The bright tracks in the image are generated by cosmic rays, cosmic dust particles reflecting sunlight, and particles from the probe itself. The dark spot at the bottom of Venus is an artifact of the image. The thin, bright region around the edge of the planet may be a night glow in Venus's upper atmosphere, created by oxygen atoms. Now, we suggest going to Jupiter. The photographs obtained from the Juno spacecraft will help us with this planet. They're often compared to paintings by Claude Monet and Van Gogh. People with a rich imagination see aliens, dolphins, and dragons here. One thing is clear, it's impossible not to admire the views that we can observe thanks to the Juno Cam optical camera. Also, the fact is that scientists made a mistake once again. This planet is much more complicated and interesting than they thought. Take a closer look at the details in this photo. They literally make you uncomfortable. This is an image of the south pole of Jupiter, which we can see thanks to several photographs stitched together. In reality, the poles are only half illuminated due to the slight tilt of the planet's axis of rotation, but thanks to the imaging of enthusiasts, we can see the pole in all its glory. And this photo gives us shivers, but NASA experts say that this is a common phenomenon for Jupiter vortex clouds over the northern hemisphere of the planet. Thanks to color correction, the frame shows part of the northern temperate zone, a noticeable red-orange region located in the region of 40 degrees in the northern part of the planet. The giant storm, known as the White Oval, is also visible in the photo, along with a series of small cloudy regions. The dark regions reflect places where the cloud cover descends closer to the interior of the planet. According to the infrared sensor, these dark regions are hotter than the upper swirling regions. Would you like to go on a tour to the rings of Jupiter and see them from the inside? The Juno probe has already been here. Its first ever photograph of Jupiter's inside rings make us turn on our fantasy to the maximum. The probe was just under 3,000 miles away and took this photo with a star tracker. Even the background turned out to be remarkable. The upper part of the constellation Orion made it into the frame, and the bright star is Betelgeuse. Our next stop is Pluto. A few years ago, the automatic interplanetary New Horizons probe went there with gifts. In addition to scientific equipment, it brought a capsule with some of the ashes of Clyde Tombo, the discoverer of Pluto. As well as a CD with the names of 434,738 people who participated in the Send Your Name to Pluto NASA action, as well as two coins. two U.S. flags, a Spaceship One fragment, which was the first manned private spacecraft, a CD with photographs of the craft and its developers, and a 1991 U.S. postage stamp. 
This is probably the most famous photograph of our dwarf planet, titled The Heart of Pluto. It was taken on July 13, 2015, from a distance of about 768,000 kilometers. Pluto doesn't have a very thick atmosphere, but we managed to photograph it too. It's really blue. When scientists received this image, they decided that they simply must have drunk too much coffee. Later, they finally agreed that there really were mountain ranges on the surface of Pluto, covered with caps of methane snow. And of course, we can't forget Mars. Unlike other planets, numerous expeditions have recently lined up to visit this angry red planet. In just one month, in 2021, scientists successfully launched the Al Amal Interplanetary Station into Martian orbit, the first in the history of the UAE and the entire Middle East region. This was soon followed by the Chinese orbital Tianwen-1 probe, and then NASA's Perseverance rover caught up with them. Tianwen-1 managed to photograph the southern and northern hemispheres of Mars, and in these photos, they have the shape of a crescent. Despite the fact that most of the planet was in shadow, they look bewitching. Also, the Chinese probe took detailed photographs of the Martian surface, which show craters, mountain ranges, and dunes. According to experts, the diameter of the largest crater recorded in the image is about 620 meters. The Arab Hope probe also managed to take a panoramic picture of the red planet, which I would like to consider in detail. The photo shows three shield volcanoes standing in a row, and Mount Olympus, an extinct volcano on Mars, the highest in the solar system. Astronomers observing the red planet through telescopes on Earth are familiar with this view, but this is a rare image for satellites near Mars. Who knows, perhaps in the near future, some countries will be able to create the first Martian base and enter the annals of space exploration forever. In the meantime, it remains for us to enjoy these beautiful pictures of these amazing planets while we strive to live our lives peacefully here on good old planet Earth. We have no place to go just yet, but that's just for now. Did you watch disaster movies when you were a child? Were you afraid that our planet might collide with another space object? At different times, we've heard or seen many different stories about the fall of meteorites. Yes, in fact, the Earth does collide with different small bodies every day. But the likelihood is extremely small that we'll meet something much larger on our journey through space. Although, there are objects in our solar system that, unlike us, have not been able to avoid such a fate. In this case, Callisto, the moon of Jupiter, became the lucky one, if you want to call it that. It seems like most of the objects in our planetary system have crashed into it. It's also in second place as the space body with the highest number of craters on its surface. Only Phobos, a moon of Saturn, has more. Let's go a little deeper into history. Callisto was discovered, along with three other moons, by famous Italian scientist Galileo Galilei in the 17th century. The moon was named after Callisto, an ancient Greek nymph, daughter of the Arcadian king Lycaon. In translation, the name means the most beautiful. At the time of its discovery, Callisto was listed in all documents as one of the four moons of Jupiter. In those days, it could only be seen remotely through a telescope. A significant contribution to the study of the object was made by the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 research devices, which we've already discussed with you in previous episodes. They were zipping through space near the great giant planet Jupiter. As a result, we received wonderful images of Callisto and some information regarding its characteristics. From 1994 to 2003, the Galileo device, which was designed specifically to study Jupiter, circled Callisto several times. In 2000, a probe called Cassini, which was sent to Saturn to study it, recorded the infrared spectrum of Jupiter's moon, which had a high resolution. In 2007, we also got more pictures of Callisto.
A year ago, the European Space Agency and NASA jointly launched a project to explore Jupiter's moons and also its magnetosphere. Four developments for space exploration took part in it. Callisto is considered one of the largest moons in our planetary system. Only the moons Ganymede and Titan are larger. Its radius is more than 2,000 kilometers and its diameter is almost the same as that of Mercury. Like our moon, it always moves in an orbit and is tidally locked to its planet, always showing only one side. The density of Callisto is several times less than the density of our planet, as it actually contains a roughly equal amount of ice and stones. The moon's ice layer is about 200 kilometers thick. It's assumed that under this layer, there's a salty ocean with a depth of about 10 kilometers. It can exist in a liquid state, that is, not freeze, only if there's a certain amount of ammonia in its composition. Otherwise, the top layer of ice would be about 300 kilometers thick. In front of a crater, the inner side of the object doesn't show any damage. This fact may indicate that water blocks impact shock waves. The next layer is the mantle, which includes particles of ice and various rocks. The shorter the distance to the center, the greater is the density of this mixture. Why does Callisto stand out from other moons? It doesn't have a core that can be easily identified as separate from other layers. It's assumed that it contains silicates, which means that its diameter would not be more than about 600 kilometers. If there is a layer of water on this moon of Jupiter, we can assume that life could possibly arise there. But that said, conditions are not the most suitable. Although Callisto's upper layer is mostly ice, its color is brownish. This is due to the fact that cosmic dust and other debris accumulate on its surface. If you carefully study the images of Callisto, you'll see that some areas appear brighter. This is due to the fact that in certain places, dust doesn't accumulate in great quantities. During study of the moon, a huge number of craters were observed. There are so many of them that as their number grows, they overlap each other. This fact lets us understand that Callisto is quite old, about 4 billion years old. Where do you think all these craters came from? You might think it logical to assume they're from volcanoes, but scientists found that there was no pronounced volcanic activity on Callisto. This means that these are all traces of collisions with other space objects. Thus, the relief map of Callisto is quite fascinating. It contains both multi-ring formations and systems of craters. One of the largest craters is called Asgard, whose diameter exceeds 1,500 kilometers, and its age is over 3 billion years. This name, which some of you might recognize, was also taken from mythology. This was the name of the residence of the Scandinavian gods. You know, where Thor lives. On Callisto, Asgard can be recognized by its brightness and the circles around it. There are two more craters within the crater itself. Do is located in the central part, and Utgar in the north, and it has a width of approximately 600 kilometers. Near Asgard, there are also other impact craters, with their main features being that they also glow quite brightly. Another huge crater, Valhalla, is the largest of the impact craters in the planetary system and is located near the equator. If we count the formations in the form of the circles around it, then its diameter reaches over 3,800 kilometers. Notably, Valhalla was recorded by one of the voyagers at the beginning of its mission. Researchers conditionally divide this crater into three parts, an inner one with a diameter of 360 kilometers and a fairly smooth surface, as well as zones of rocks and also areas of depressions. It's worth mentioning another of the largest impact craters on Callisto, Heimdall. Its diameter reaches 210 kilometers and it's located close to the South Pole. It was first recorded by Voyager 1, and then Galileo provided pictures of the crater. The name Heimdall may ring a bell for you Marvel fans out there as well. It got its name from a deity of Scandinavian mythology. Heimdall was the god of light in that magical, mythical world. 
In the year 2000, this name was officially approved by the Astronomical Union. There's another notable crater on Callisto, Ad Linda, whose name was also taken from Norse mythology. And it's the third largest of all impact craters. The diameter of Ad Linda reaches thousands of kilometers. Like Heimdall, this crater is located in the southern part of the moon. There's another young crater on Ad Linda called Lofen. So far, it hasn't been possible to study its properties in more detail. There are ring structures near the Ad Linda crater, but they're virtually impossible to see in the images. It's worth paying attention to the Gipple Chain, a system 620 kilometers long of craters on Callisto. Such a chain is the longest formation on Jupiter's moon. After some time, the upper layers of Callisto can collapse, whereupon the terrain becomes flat, so low mountain ranges and craters can form in these places. By the way, no tectonic activity has ever been recorded on Callisto. Its state in the solar system has been stable since its formation. The atmospheric layer of Callisto contains carbon dioxide and presumably molecular oxygen, which makes it quite rarefied compared to the Earth's atmosphere. In the ionosphere of the Moon, scientists have not recorded high levels of radiation, which means that a person could stay there if they so desired and had a chance to visit. Because of this, and the fact that Callisto has a water layer, it's suggested that this space object could be considered as a potential place for life. This was confirmed by NASA research in 2003. Scientists say that manned space flight to Callisto will be possible in about 20 years. And who knows, perhaps then, even our wildest space-faring fantasies will start to come true. Back in 1977, the Americans launched a project called Voyager. Within this framework, two probes, Voyager 1 and 2, were sent into space. It seems to be a rather banal scenario, but the results of this endeavor exceeded all expectations. Have you ever heard the sounds of space? Of course, you may argue that the vacuum is absolutely mute. After all, sound waves can only propagate in the presence of molecules that transmit vibrations. However, thanks to computer transformation, we can hear the booming rumble of Venus. The monotonous howl of Jupiter and the pulsating cacophony of Mercury. These are the voices of the planets, but what does the echo of deep space sound like? Apart from the voyagers, only the pioneers have been there, but communication with them has long since ended. A little later, we'll give you the opportunity to hear the frightening sounds of the universe. But for now, we'll briefly describe the most interesting stages of the mission of the two probes, which has not yet been completed. Highly autonomous vehicles were created to study the outer planets of the solar system, with the subsequent flight of the probes going beyond the heliosphere. When organizing the mission, past mistakes were taken into account. For example, Pioneer 10 stopped responding, probably because its source of radioisotope power had been depleted. By the way, the device is now supposedly heading towards Aldebaran, and this journey will last about 2 million years. Anyway, the issue of power supply for the probes had to be given special attention. Engineers equipped the Voyagers with their own plutonium-238 thermoelectric generators and rocket engines, as well as many computers and other useful equipment, such as spectrometers, cameras, plasma systems, and so on. Despite problems, the devices managed to successfully explore the outer planets of the solar system and then proceed into the depths of outer space. Everyone knows that the boundaries of the possessions of our parent star do not immediately end after Neptune. The Voyagers carry on their sides golden plates with recordings of the sounds of the Earth, such as volcanic eruptions, wind noise, and the crying of a child, still had a very long and difficult way to go. 
Fortunately, the technical capabilities of both Voyagers will allow us to contact them until the year 2030. What is the task facing the probes at the moment? The main purpose of the devices is to study the transition region between the plasma located in the solar system and regions in interstellar space. A few years ago, the devices crossed the first boundary that separates our planets from the cold darkness of space, the heliospheric shockwave. Voyager 1 did this in December 2004, and Voyager 2 did it in August 2007. The boundary of the shockwave is the region located inside the heliosphere. This is where the solar wind breaks sharply to sonic speeds as it collides with interstellar matter. It's worth noting that the solar wind flies at a speed of about 1 million kilometers an hour for the first 10 billion kilometers, and only the presence of cosmic particles can slow down this voyage. After this boundary, the devices waited for the next boundary, the heliopause, which, as scientists suggest, they should reach 10 years after crossing the boundaries of the shockwave. Therefore, most likely, this event has already taken place. The heliopause can be compared to an airlock, where the pressure is equalized when astronauts go out into outer space. It's here that the speed parameters of the solar wind and the interstellar medium acquire acceptable values, and partial mutual assimilation of matter occurs. In general, disputes have been going on about the nature of the heliopause for several years. It was believed that it was located near the orbit of Jupiter, but Voyager 2 to dispel this myth. Since no one knew where the boundary was located, astronomers doubted that the probe would cross it before it stopped working. But in 2018, Voyager 2 officially managed to cross the heliopause before being stopped. It turned out that it's 120 times farther than the Earth from the Sun. Thanks to the measurements that both probes periodically sent, it was possible to find out that the heliosphere is quite elastic. During periods of solar activity, it inflates like a balloon and then returns to its previous size. What other discovery did Voyager 2 make? In 2020, its plasma sensors discovered one inexplicable oddity. The further the probe moves away from the Sun, the more the density of interstellar space increases. Perhaps particles slow down sharply as they approach the heliopause and pile up on top of each other like a snowdrift. There is another theory. It references the collision of the interstellar magnetic field with the heliosphere, which creates a kind of corridor between the heliopause and the rest of space. By the way, according to measurements, interstellar magnetism, although 64,000 times weaker than the Earth's at only 7 microgauss, it's still capable of exerting a certain pressure on the heliosphere. Be that as it may, the question of the increased density of matter remains open, and scientists have yet to find an answer. Is there a danger of the destruction of both Voyagers under such conditions? Theoretically, yes. According to popular hypotheses, between the bow shockwave, the conditional Rubicon during the transition to the absolute vacuum of space, there's another area filled with hot hydrogen. Scientists have nicknamed it the Hydrogen Wall. The hypothetical bow shock is located at a distance of 230 astronomical units from the Sun, and the Voyagers still have to overcome it. Although it should be said that many astronomers consider this imaginary boundary an idle fiction. But back to the Voyagers. Where are they now? Back in 2012, the first probe reached the boundaries of the interstellar medium. Its sensors registered an increase in the number of galactic rays, and later, a sharp decrease in solar wind particles. These data provide strong evidence that the probe is finally leaving the heliosphere. It was in this place that the device recorded a strange sound, a monotonous hum interrupted by a piercing whistle. It 
It's not clear what exactly causes these gloomy moans, but goosebumps are definitely par for the course. Some astronomers argue that the sharp whistle is probably caused by regular solar flares that reach the outskirts of the heliosphere. Voyager 1 overheard all of this in passing, since the journey of the device is far from over. In 40,000 years, it will fly past the red dwarf Gliese 445, slowly approaching the star, and will continue to wander forever through our galaxy. But what about Voyager 2? Is it also soaring somewhere through the darkness of space? As already mentioned, 14 years ago, the device successfully crossed the heliospheric shockwave and passed the heliopause. Thanks to the data obtained from Voyager 2, it was possible to prove that the heliosphere is not a perfect sphere. On the contrary, it's a flattened oval with northern boundaries distant from the sun. Were any oddities recorded in the information transmitted by the apparatus? Yes, there was one discrepancy. Scientists expected that at the edge of the shockwave, the temperature should be much higher than inside the heliosphere, but that wasn't found. Rather, it was hot, but not as hot as astronomers expected. Question, where did the discrepancies come from and where did the excess energy disappear to? So far, this remains unanswered. The second Voyager is now about 20 billion miles from Earth and is heading steadily towards the Oort cloud. It will reach the cloud three centuries from now, and to fly through this spherical region, it will take at least 30,000 years. Unfortunately, we'll never know about this. The half-life of plutonium is around 90 years, and even now the energy resources of the devices have decreased to 40% or less. Both devices, launched with a difference of just around a month, are now hundreds of astronomical units from the Sun and are not going to stop. They're waiting for their future meetings with stars, their planets, lonely comets, and flocks of asteroids. Thanks to the probes, we now know how the emptiness of the macrocosm sounds and are empirically convinced of the presence of the heliosphere, which protects our planetary system from the aggressive effects of galactic rays. Subscribe to the Hubble channel and learn about everything that happens in the universe. We live in an interesting and pretty dynamic time. This fact was proved once again by the Chinese, who launched a Chang'e 4 automatic interplanetary station to study the reverse side of the moon. The moon has always interested Earthlings more than other celestial bodies, and now the big time has come. Now humanity will surely find out what hides on the so-called dark side of the moon, which by the way is illuminated by the sun no less than the light one. The Chang'e 4 lander, named after the Chinese pantheon lunar goddess, successfully launched from the Zijiang Cosmodrome on December 7, 2018, while aboard a Long March 3B launch vehicle. On January 3, 2019, in the early morning after a 26-day flight, Chang'e 4 made a soft landing on the lunar surface. The mission started as a sensation. Soon Chang'e 4 sent a series of excellent panoramic images of the moon in its natural form to Earth. Here's the moon gallery. This is the historical photo taken by the stationary module. Now take a close look, what is it? The wheel of the lunar rover before it left the overpass. And here are the images showing how the Yututu rover carefully slides into the lunar dust. Look intently at this photo, it shows how the lunar rover begins to move. A landmark video was also shot that captured the moment of landing. Right now you're watching a fragment of video from the onboard camera that captured the moment of the moon landing. A link to the full version is provided in the description. The first picture shocked the world. It turned out that the color of the dust of the moon isn't the same as expected. According to the photo, the lunar views are more like a reddish Martian landscape. Later, the reason became clear. The image was made by uncalibrated cameras, hence the unusual effect. 
It's explained relatively simply. If you set different color temperature parameters on the camera equipment, the images may differ in both warm and cool shades. Let's give an example. Now the camera is set to a temperature of 2,500 kelvins. Let's see what happened as a result. Now let's try to take the same photo, but with the parameters of 10,000 kelvins. The effect is obvious. The same object, identical lighting, but there's a difference in the highlight. How to understand if the camera is calibrated correctly? For example, in the image of the Apollo 17 mission, a special multicolored marker is seen in the frame, which you can use to orient. On the right, there is an orange spot of land, although the rest of the landscape is gray. Next to it, we see an image with natural calibration. This photo of the lunar rover is from the TIK camera. Obviously, there is no redness, and now you have a view from the rover to the stationary module. It's noticeable that the shades slightly differ, since the lunar rover has a camera with different calibration settings. But most importantly, we have the first full 360 degree panorama of the landing site. You can find the full resolution version of the panorama in the description so that you can see the full scale version in detail and enjoy the harsh lunar beauty. The landing site of the interplanetary station was the ancient impact crater of Theodore von Kormann. It's part of a global formation called the South Pole Aitken Basin. It's the largest crater on the Moon and in the Solar System. Its dimensions are 2,400 by 2,050 kilometers, and its depth varies from 8 to 16 kilometers. Before landing, Chang'e 4 first used the technology of preliminary scanning of the terrain to determine the most acceptable landing location. It's worth noting that the launch of Chang'e 4 is part of China's lunar program, which involves a phased study of the moon. The mission consists of three stages. The second intermediate stage is aimed at organizing soft landings of lunar rovers on the moon. The last stage of the program is planned for this year. Now let's get back to U-2-2. A few hours after the lunar landing, the Chinese 140kg Jade Hare 2 rover moved unhindered from the lander and safely fell into a week-long hibernation. Meanwhile, the Chang'e 4 station passed a long fire test. The lunar day turned out to be a hot thing. What is the lunar rover equipped with to perform its task efficiently? It's literally stuffed with useful things. Four panoramic cameras, the georadar for probing regolith layers, an infrared spectrometer, and an atomic analyzer that calculates the intensity of interaction between the solar wind and the lunar surface. All devices were developed by the best engineering labs in the world. For example, the radiometer was created by German specialists. It will help measure the degree of radiation attacks that future astronauts will be exposed to. The energy potential of the lunar rover is supported by an atomic source that works due to the decay of plutonium-238. What hopes do scientists have for the U-22 lunar rover? First of all, this is a fence and soil study. Experts hope to find fragments of rock on the moon knocked out by meteorites from under the upper layers of the mantle. This will shed some light on the geological structure of the moon. The lunar rover will also measure the temperature amplitudes of day and night and try to find water. Among other things, the mission will allow scientists to test the capabilities of deep space communications and conduct low-frequency radio astronomy observations because on the reverse side of the moon, interference from the Earth isn't a problem for the equipment. This will shed light on understanding the nature of radiation that was present in the early stages of the universe. To hear the Chang'e 4 station, which is located outside the line of sight, a quick Quayo relay satellite was launched. Its name literally translates as Magpie Bridge. The probe entered orbit at the Lagrange point, making it equally visible from the Earth and the Moon. What did the little U-22 do during this time? We don't want to disappoint you, but the rover was mostly asleep. 
After coming out of hibernation mode on January 10, 2019, U22 was busy doing a photo session for four days, and on January 14th, with the onset of a harsh lunar night, the device and the lander fell into a life-saving hibernation again, because as soon as the sun's rays stop illuminating the surface of the moon, the temperature there drops to minus 190 degrees. On January 29, the rover finally continued its mission. The most important experiment, which has no analogs in the history of cosmonautics, was a biological experiment with plants and insect eggs. A container simulating the conditions of the artificial biosphere is installed on board the station. In the pressure chamber was placed land, water, air, potato seeds, rapeseed, Arabidopsis, cotton, Rosophila eggs, and yeast fungi. The heat controller maintains a constant temperature of plus 25 degrees Celsius in the container. After the Chang'e 4 landed, the seeds were immediately watered, and what a miracle! Twelve days later, the cameras recorded the germination of cotton. This is a major breakthrough, because this has never happened on the surface of another celestial body. Due to the onset of the moonlit night, the support mode was disabled and the experiment ended. But the beginning was made. Research in this area will be expanded and supplemented. This will help to gain experience for the organization of future lunar bases, which will have to create such ecosystems. The mission made China famous. No spacecraft has ever landed on the far side of the moon before, but the lunar rover will have a difficult task. On February 27, the Xinhua News Agency reported that the spacecraft encountered the first difficulties associated with the complex terrain of the lunar surface. Despite the presence of six maneuverable wheels and four-wheel drive base, the U-22 is difficult to move. So the team is slightly puzzled and looking for acceptable routes for the lunar rover. Obstacles are unavoidable, and the flight organizers didn't expect the mission to be easy. One thing is important. A detailed study of the reverse side of the moon was undertaken not to find evidence of a lunar conspiracy, but to make life easier for future colonists who will find themselves in an alien, aggressive, and extreme environment. A new era of space exploration and the preparation of a manned mission to the moon has begun. This gives us hope that our descendants will be able to fly to neighboring planets on vacation. We are incredibly lucky that the Earth is located next to a stable star and has the necessary conditions for people to live comfortably. But is it so bad to live on other planets? What if life exists not only on Earth? Could we find even better places to live? For example, possible indicators of extraterrestrial life have recently been discovered on Enceladus, Saturn's moon. In its geysers, scientists have found methane, which most likely confirms the presence of life on Enceladus, or perhaps it's just geo- or thermochemical processes. There's so much methane in the geysers of Enceladus that such an amount cannot be explained by a non-biological origin. Scientists conducted a series of studies during which they couldn't explain why there's so much methane in the geysers of Saturn's satellite. Moreover, its reserves are constantly replenished and evaporate into space. However, it all makes sense if we assume the presence of microbes there, the likes of which can also be found in hydrothermal vents here on Earth. Scientists believe that Enceladus produces enough hydrogen, which is necessary for such microbes, and the temperature is kept at a comfortable level for them. So, does life exist on Enceladus? No one's yet ready to confirm this statement. They say that complex deep-sea missions are needed, and they're not foreseen for at least the next few decades. A similar story happened with Venus. Phosphine is found in the clouds of the planet, a gas that's produced only by either an industrial method or by microbes living in an oxygen-free environment. When scientists received the first hints of phosphine in the spectrum of Venus, they were shocked and couldn't believe their luck for a long time. How to explain the presence of this gas? 
Scientists suggest that phosphine could enter the atmosphere as a result of non-biological processes, but it turned out that all non-biological sources produce a maximum of one ten-thousandth of the amount of phosphine that was recorded by telescopes. Phosphine, or rather phosphorus hydride, is a poisonous gas that has no color and is quite rare in nature. As a rule, it's released during a chemical reaction in production from a lightning strike, more as the result of volcanic activity. But on Venus, it was found in extremely large quantities. How the heck did it get there? Most likely as a result of the vital activity of bacteria that live in an oxygen-free environment. This version seems to astronomers the most likely. However, they don't exclude the possibility that they could have missed something and that perhaps there's some other explanation of where so much phosphine came from on Venus. At the same time, Nathan Eismont, a researcher at the Space Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences, is convinced that there is the highest probability of finding life on Venus. To this end, the Venera D project has already been approved. But why do we pin such high hopes on Venus? According to Eismont, the Earth and Venus are very similar. They have similar masses and dimensions, but will the search for life succeed on Venus? Probably not. Indeed, even the atmosphere in which phosphine was discovered consists of extremely dry and acidic air, almost devoid of water. In addition, Venus is almost one and a half times closer to the sun than our planet, and its surface would seem too hot for any life forms to exist on it. The average temperature there is about 460 degrees Celsius. Under such conditions, even lead melts. This means if astronauts go to Venus in the future, they'll first be dissolved in sulfuric acid and then poison themselves with phosphine. If some creatures really do live there, then we won't know about them anytime soon. However, scientists are sure that there were times when the climate on Venus was much milder and its surface was most likely covered with oceans in which life could have arisen. However, since then, a strong greenhouse effect has dried up the oceans and now only microorganisms could possibly continue to exist there. So what about other planets? Maybe somewhere out there, there are more suitable conditions for life. In 2002, British scientists discovered that Jupiter has a wetter atmosphere than Venus. Of course, the harsh conditions on the planet seemingly leave no chance for even the most unpretentious life forms to exist there. But the latest discoveries by scientists do indeed leave this question open. The fact is that sulfur dioxide was found in the clouds of Jupiter, the drops of which contain a fairly large amount of water. Assuming that it contains nutrients, then microbial life could exist in the clouds of Jupiter. And maybe not only microbial, at least that is on Jupiter's moon Europa. It's hypothesized that alien life may be hiding under a thick layer of ice on this small satellite. Data from telescopes and spacecraft give us reason to believe that Europa could be hiding a global ocean from us, one which our solar system is not allowing to freeze. Who could live there besides microbes? Monica Grady, rector of the University of Liverpool, believes that Europa is more developed for life than Mars. Thanks to the warm under ice ocean, living conditions on Jupiter's moon are more comfortable and could offer better opportunities for survival. In addition, organic matter rises from the bowels of the satellite, which could be used as food for living organisms. If this is true, future colonists may well encounter much higher forms of life than previously thought. There's an opinion that the minds of some inhabitants of Europa could correspond, for example, to the level of that of squids or octopuses. What if mermaids or aquamen live in the oceans of Europa, but we just don't know anything about it yet? Could they feed on the creatures existing there and perhaps live in underwater homes? 
There are no answers to these questions yet, but experts are inclined to believe that life forms similar to humans are unlikely to appear in the vicinity of Jupiter. This is unlikely due to the lack of light in the depths of Europa's ocean and the powerful pressure of the ice sheet. Now, let's move on to dwarf planet Ceres with its splashing sea waves. Scientists came to this opinion after studying emissions from the Akatur cryovolcano located on Ceres. Cryovolcanoes are a specific type of volcano found on planets and other celestial bodies, which are characterized by extremely low temperatures. Instead of hot lava, they spew a mixture of water, ammonia, and methane. According to scientists, cryovolcanoes indicate the presence of water inside the planet Ceres. Sodium carbonate deposits have also been found on the surface of the planet. Paul Schenk from the Lunar and Planetary Institute believes that the similarity of some processes on Mars, Earth, and Ceres may indicate favorable conditions for the emergence and evolution of life. In his opinion, on water-rich Mars and Earth, life must have arisen. After studying the cartography of this dwarf planet, Halshank discovered similar deposits in the region of the Akater Crater. Some of the most common elements in the universe are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, and iron, and they're necessary for the existence of organic life. In particular, a human needs water to drink, air to breathe, and a planet with a surface on which to move. If all these components could one day come together on Earth and set off the processes necessary for the development of life, then why can't it also happen on one of the hundreds of billions of exoplanets that exist in our galaxy? According to the laws of statistics, life simply must have sprung forth on more planets than just the Earth. The only question is, will we find it? And if we find it, what actions will we take next? Over the past 30 years, astronomers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets, planets located outside the solar system. Most of them revolve around their stars. Many exoplanets contain the same elements as the planets of our solar system. There are only slight differences. Some of them are dominated by water and ice, while others are dominated by iron and carbon. However, we've yet to find a single planet identical or extremely similar to the Earth or other bodies of the solar system. However, there are so-called terrestrial planets. For example, TRAPPIST-1d, like the Earth, is the third planet from its star, which, in terms of the composition of its soil, may be similar to our planet. Also, this object is located in the habitable zone, the region where the amount of heat from the star is sufficient for the existence of liquid water on the surface. Now, let's take a look at TRAPPIST-1e, which is 60% the size of our Earth. It's noteworthy that a year on this planet lasts only 6.1 days. An interesting fact is that the density of this planet exceeds the density of the Earth by several times. It's all about it having a denser iron core, which may be the reason why the planet's atmosphere is more rarefied. And this means that the presence of oceans on the planet remains questionable. However, TRAPPIST-1e is the most similar to our Earth in terms of size and the amount of energy that circulates there, which comes from the local star. Could intelligent life exist there? So far, we don't have enough computing power to study these planets in more detail. However, Geneva Observatory astrophysicist Andre Mater believes that in the search for life in the universe, we're more likely to find bacteria than something like an intelligent civilization from Star Wars. It takes time for such a civilization to emerge, as well as stable, basic physical conditions. The Earth had such privileges, and not only that. For example, our moon gives us an optimal climate, and the gas giant Jupiter attracts almost all asteroids flying into the solar system. Without Jupiter, Earth would be much more likely to experience catastrophes like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So, for now anyway, the facts only indicate that if there are extraterrestrial inhabitants somewhere, they're probably single-celled, at least in our solar system. 
Or maybe we and these other intelligent beings somehow just missed each other in time and in space. What do you see on the screen? No, this is not a black spot, but an empty area in the sky at night. But can you really believe your eyes? After all, now you're peering not just at blackness, but at tens of thousands of luminous objects. However, until recently, this picture could only be seen with the help of telescopes. Meanwhile, we don't know who, when, or even if anyone has ever approached our solar system. And this is despite the fact that the scientific world recently announced that there are 20 exoplanets from which it's possible to contemplate our vast Earth and, most interestingly, even receive our radio transmissions. Do you already have thoughts that aliens are watching you? Throw away all negative thoughts and worries, because now you'll find out what did the NASA space probe Juno manage to capture? What do we know about the largest planet in the solar system? And how would life develop on Earth without Jupiter? The gas giant Jupiter plays the role of a global vacuum cleaner by not allowing most asteroids and comets to reach us. Otherwise, constant catastrophes would hardly have allowed human civilization to reach its current level. That's why the study of our gigantic neighbor is a priority astronomical task. Launched on August 5, 2011, the Juno robotic interplanetary spacecraft has become one of the most unique among such probes functioning in remote parts of the solar system. So what's so special about it? The probe receives energy for operation from autonomous solar panels of various lengths, since Juno doesn't have a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. At the same time, the orbital station has been surviving the difficult conditions of space for many years and regularly provides scientists with valuable scientific information, especially about the gas giant Jupiter. So, how difficult was the journey to this distant and hostile world? Juno reached the huge planet five years after the launch of the mission and quickly found itself in its elliptical orbit. The probe's five scientific instruments were immediately activated. Further, it was assumed that the probe would continue to work in a tight orbit of the planet, but due to technical and software malfunctions, this plan failed. Two years ago, the probe faced a difficult and dangerous situation. Due to a 53-day stay in an oblong orbit, Juno was forced to be in the dense, impenetrable shadow of the gas giant for about 12 hours. In this frightening location, borderline low temperatures and extremely low levels of light were recorded. So, it's not surprising that the planned capabilities of Juno didn't involve operating under such extreme conditions without the sun's rays. If the craft had stayed in the shadow of Jupiter just a little longer, it would probably have failed completely. So, as you can see, even the shadow of a gas colossus can pose a considerable danger to our space probes. Previously, the probe experienced a similar situation for a period of only 10 minutes. This happened literally just at the start of its mission, when Juno left the Earth and briefly fell into its shadow. But couldn't the ship have been reprogrammed to avoid contact with the giant shadow? One of the reasons why Juno didn't move to a lower orbit, but remained in an oblong elliptical one, was the strong gravitational field of Jupiter. The oblong trajectory of the ship's movement eliminates the influence of this force, and also ensures that the probe won't be in the shadow of the planet for too long. But it's not just difficulties that have accompanied the mission, there have been great successes as well. In April last year, Juno passed close to the surface of the gas giant's cloud layer, reaching an incredible speed of 206,000 kilometers per hour. So why focus on this? 
It's simple. Thanks to the lightning-fast maneuver, the probe sent dozens of amazing images and invaluable scientific data to Earth. And this despite the fact that the craft isn't able to stay so dangerously close to Jupiter for much time at all. This is due to the monstrous radiation emanating from the planet that can lead to multiple serious malfunctions, although the most important mechanisms of the ship are protected by special titanium plates. If this threat were ignored, then Juno's activities would have had to have been stopped ahead of schedule. How did it happen that after 12 hours spent in the shadow captivity of Jupiter, the orbital station was able to continue its mission? Desperate scientists went all in. They decided to spend a shocking amount of the craft's hydrazine jet fuel with a total weight of 73 kilograms to provide enough energy to keep Juno alive. As a result, the engine worked continuously for more than 10 hours. Why was the mission plan significantly adjusted? Juno was supposed to be near Jupiter for exactly one year, but in 2018 it was decided to extend its work until July 2021 because the project had showed exemplary results so far. And besides, funding for the mission had been increased significantly. In general, during operation, Juno made 35 extremely close loops just above the surface of Jupiter. What else did the probe please scientists with? Astronomers have received a huge amount of valuable data about Jupiter. Using a microwave radiometer capable of penetrating more than 500 kilometers into clouds, the probe transmitted information to Earth about the deepest parts of the gas giant's atmosphere. From this, the researchers were able to find out how much water and ammonia are contained in the atmospheric layers in percentage terms. Another goal of the Juno mission was to collect information about how Jupiter was formed and at what depths atmospheric flows circulate. In order to obtain more extensive data on the phenomena occurring in the magnetosphere and to map the force regions near the gas giant, the probe activated a special device that determines the position of objects relative to magnetic fields. As for the ultraviolet radiation spectrograph, with its help, scientists received more detailed information about Jupiter's auroras dazzlingly sparkling at the poles of the planet. And in order to make a map that can be used to calculate mass distribution on Jupiter, a special device estimated the magnitude of the fields of the gas giant. But how did such impressive photographs of our gigantic neighbor appear? The only static camera on Juno is to be commended for that. It was this tricolor, highly intelligent gadget that contributed to the amazing images of Jupiter that flew around the world. Titanic cyclones and anti-cyclones recorded in the area of the Great Red Spot and at the poles also made their way into the lens of this wonderful camera. Which valuable and significant discoveries can we single out over the entire period of Juno's mission? In particular, it was confirmed that Jupiter has a high-density core, but it contains loose and porous material and not solidified hydrogen or stones as previously assumed. The formation process of this structural element is still unknown. Most likely, a clarification of this riddle will be a goal of Jupiter's further research. In any case, at the moment, we've received much more information about many phenomena. For example, we've learned more about what's happening inside the famous anti-cyclone hurricane called the Great Red Spot. The strange whirlwind has been observed since the 19th century, and since then its size has decreased significantly. Right now, the diameter of the storm is 1.3 tenths the diameter of the Earth. Back in 1979, it was closer to double the diameter of our planet. Juno also found that the crater at the base of the Great Red Spot, the so-called Eye of the Hurricane, 
has an incredible depth of around 300 kilometers, and local temperatures rise significantly as you approach the center. This explains the appearance of powerful winds in the upper layers of the hurricane. Juno also received information about the anomalies occurring in the magnetic field of Jupiter. In particular, its asymmetry, which is observed in the complex structure of the field in the northern hemisphere. Scientists can't say anything definite about the reasons for this phenomenon, since the magnetic fields of Jupiter and the Earth are significantly different. There have been suggestions that these are the consequences of the dissolution of Jupiter's core. Researchers were very surprised to find a very bright, narrow band emitting ultraviolet. This discovery was facilitated by the ultraviolet spectrograph installed on Juno. Is this a miraculous transformation of Jupiter into a star? Most probably not. Perhaps this was just lightning strikes, very powerful ones. The peculiarity of the ultraviolet band signal is that just after detection, it immediately disappeared. There's a theory that we observed a phenomenon called sprites, lightning discharges that are extremely rare. If such flashes of light were found on Earth, we would notice their reddish hue. And on Jupiter, due to the large amount of hydrogen, the bands appear blue. Another important discovery made by Juno was the detection of an abundant amount of water molecules at the equator, as well as signs that the planet once had heavy rains. And a long time ago, Jupiter experienced a bombardment of ammonia hail and powerful lightning strikes. These elements were the most important factor in the formation of the cycle of water layers on Jupiter. Also, with the help of Juno, it was possible to determine the most arid region of the planet, a kind of Jovian desert located in the northern hemisphere slightly above the equator. And what about the cloud layer on Jupiter? Astronomers carefully analyzed the cloud images provided by the probe and found the following. They clearly show that the atmospheric masses that are above the polar cyclones move counterclockwise, while the hurricane spirals rotate clockwise. As we've already said, the main part of the Juno mission was completed in July 2021. But this doesn't mean that the device was sent to a well-deserved rest. The current state of the probe will allow it to continue working until at least 2025. During this period, Juno will make four more orbits around.